uh, one plan in this portfolio view, which is a list view right now, which is a list of uh, elements uh, that I'm looking at, we can have different portfolio plan or plan type hierarchies. In this particular case, a common one that we see is people want to have portfolios, and within those we add programs. And then within those programs, we may have projects and or epics. And those projects might have deliverables and epics might have features that roll up into those epics that we have to do. The key is, is you can structure the structure if you have a hybrid or a cherry pick version of a scaled uh, a portfolio that you'd like, you can do it in any way that you choose. Uh, in this particular case, if I look at that and I expand out this, notice I have portfolios with programs within it. And then within the programs, I have epics and projects that happen within those programs. And where applicable, within the epics, I have features that are coming over, as well as deliverables within the projects. The key is how I structure it for my organization for the way I want to do things is completely up to me in the way that I'd like to do that. Okay, so um, if you notice here, we have links or icons of different tools. For example, we have a feature that's actually coming over and an epic that's coming over from Jira. In this case, I've got an epic and some features that are coming over from Azure DevOps. I also notice here that some don't have any icons next to them, mean that they're not connected to any tools, and you might be working on that solely within one plan if you choose to do that, if you're not married to the use of, say, an Azure DevOps or a JIRA. So the key there is, is it's very flexible on how you would structure that. Now, to just go to a different model to show, just for the purposes of showing a different context here, is that I'm looking here at another portfolio here in one plan, but notice that the portfolio plan type hierarchy um, may be more conducive to your, to a pure scared, scaled agile approach uh, or safe type of uh, scenario where I've got portfolios and then I've got value streams uh, within the portfolio, then I've got epics, and then one of those epics, I've got features and user stories. And this is the case where, you know, I may, may be predominantly working on that. And we can, you know, embed into that the concept of the notion of projects with deliverables as well. So as I expand this out, as you see this, I've got portfolios broken down and I have different value streams uh, within there. Uh, within those value streams, I might have uh, projects and or epics. And then, you know, within that, you know, uh, we can then drill into the different, you know, epics and uh, features uh, and deliverables that are there uh, within that mix. So the key there is, is that it's flexible on how you would like to structure your portfolio. Now, you know, going back to this other model, you know, let's talk about portfolios and views. Now, we have the concept here of you know, being able to view our portfolio in a variety of different ways. You know, here I'm looking at one view that's showing me some you know, budgets, some KPIs, uh, what's associated with that, et cetera, in a summary view. I could also look at something that might be more, oh, say a more of a, a prioritization view. And in that prioritization view, as I'm looking at some of these things, I might be you know, looking at uh, weighted shortest job first calculations and over here could be the values uh, that were put into the different areas of business value, risk, and time criticality, cost of delay, et cetera, that are contributing to that score. So they have that. And by the way, we'll talk about intake and demand a little bit, and those could have come from the old initial request as well and promoted into this uh, as we look at this from a more you know, feature-oriented perspective. Um, you know, if we drill into one of these, and notice here in this model here, I have a bunch of features, and I'm just showing features at this level where I'm coming in and saying, um, uh, here's some that are coming in from Azure DevOps, here's come, coming in from Jira, some not connected at all. But if I drill into say this shipping and delivery uh, feature, and I go in there, the first thing we might wanna look at is the details around that. We have the ability to configure the forms of the data points that you would like to keep. You know, We have templates that uh, get you started on this, but the idea here is that uh, you can capture the data and the metadata around that. You can capture narrative around, say, business cases or um, or, or the uh, uh, the value uh, that 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 you want to present. Also, the prioritization method. So, for example, the weighted shortest job first calculation is here, but also you might have other prioritization uh, criteria that might be business driver related or something else that you might want to put in there. You also have the ability to have you know summary information about things like you know your feature points and story points how your user stories are, your schedule, the financials around that, the effort, and even the KPIs and the features around that. Uh, and this is completely configurable on the things that you'd like to keep, as well as the overall life cycle or, 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 uh, that you go through uh, with any one of these features. 
Now, um, as I look at the work plan, and this is really where the connection to an Azure DevOps, for example, would happen. Uh, we have the concept, just like we have plan types within the portfolio, we've got the concept of work type. So in a work plan, I'm looking at a backlog work type here, and that's typically where the connection to the Agile tools come in. This is where the data for that comes into this backlog type. But you'll also notice that I have a schedule work type, the more waterfallish type of things, and there's many use cases for that which we'll talk about. You can also, in the same place, track your issue log and your risks and your changes and your key decisions. Some people add lessons learned to this and other things, so it's very flexible to maybe capture all your work items in one place without having to go to different places to do that. Now, if I go into the work plan and I, let's just say, expand this, this is a small plan, but you'll see here that I've got um, user stories and I got one user story with a task underneath that. But you'll also notice that this is, uh, if I look at the connected systems tab, you can also see that I'm actually connected to Azure DevOps here. And in that being connected to Azure DevOps, um, you know, um, it's actually routinely getting that information from uh, the proper location of the proper feature within Azure DevOps. Now, if I come in here, I don't have to do anything to make that happen. Our one connect is uh, done to um, uh, routinely bring that information, typically hourly for something like this, to make sure that information comes over here without the end user in Azure DevOps having to do anything. But if you wanted to do something on demand, you could to bring that data over on demand. Now, just to bring this into context, I went over to connect to the feature that I'm connected to within here, and where I'm getting the data is this feature shipping and delivery over in Azure DevOps. If you notice here, the, ch the children here uh, are the uh, uh, two different user stories that are in here that is actually syncing back over into OnePlan. So as I look at this, the data that's in here, when we configure OneConnect, we determine what information we want to bring over here. Is it effort? Is it story points? Is it a combination of both of those things? Is it effort, uh, information around that that we would like to have? Now, you know, there is a schedule work type in here where uh, things that you're not tracking in Azure DevOps that leadership might want to see. You may put something in here as a schedule, like where you might put in a release schedule or some type of delivery schedule uh, in there that the leadership wants to see that might not be in Azure DevOps. Uh, you might put a combined thing where you might have some waterfall components in here where you might want to show waterfall and agile backlog items together in one uh, view. And that's a way that we can leverage the schedule work type. So just be aware there's flexibility at this work item level, just like there is up at the portfolio level. Now, other aspects in one plan for this particular feature is that you can actually put together your resource plans. And resource plans can be done in a variety of ways. You can actually add named individuals. You could structure this uh, by teams. You could structure it by uh, generic roles or resource types or some combination thereof. And the nice thing here is I'm showing this as planned in hours, but these things can also be planned, say, or shown in, say, FTEs or percentages of effort. So however you'd like to plan, you can toggle between those different modes to get the resource visibility that you would like to and see where we're over and under allocated. Now, in relation to everything else that's going on, I can see that Ehrlich is actually over allocated beyond what he has because uh, he has other things outside of this project. And the cool thing here is that it's always looking in context of everything in the organization. So as I'm looking at different candidates to put in here, and if I wanted to say, uh, relieve an Ehrlich of something, I could say, let me find a best match and see what resources might be available that might have the bandwidth to take this on instead of Ehrlich and be able to replace those resources here. And we can look at these things in a variety of ways. You know, we can group these resources down here, you know, by business unit, by role, by team, et cetera, and look at those things in that way. And, and be able to uh, uh, match to our methodology in the way we look at resourcing. We also have a financial planning capability in here that allows us to structure the financials in a way that we see fit. Now, the resource planning can be leveled and uh, leveraged such that we don't have to redo the labor piece. There's rates associated with our resources in here that can be uh, uh, done that way, and then automatically bring the labor costing and the timing of that labor costing in here from the resource planning. But it also gives us the ability to have non-labor things put in here. So if I wanted to track when we're gonna get costs for software and other things like that in here, I can get that information in here as well. 
and I can track different cost types, whether it be budgets, uh, revised forecasts, actuals, and I can even track benefits or uh, anticipated revenue here if I want in the same time phase fashion. And I can even compare, say, my budget to my forecast, my uh, budget to my actuals, et cetera, and be able to look at what that looks like on a comparison basis as well. And even have different time horizons so I can look at the timing if I want to look at them you know, over the this year or maybe the next year, or the next five years or some custom range. The outlook or the horizon that you look at these financials is completely up to you. The other key piece is reporting, and we'll, we'll talk about reporting across this, but I mentioned consistent status reporting. And this is sometimes a very manual effort that people go through to do that. And if we can have a common format that we like our projects or our epics, say for example, our features to report status on, we can actually have that auto, information automatically populated in here such that the current state can be automatically populated into the status report. We can leave room for narrative in here. So each reporting period, we can actually put our own unique narrative in there regarding um, this particular status. And it can be just added to the mix of what comes in here. And when we submit these each period, we actually are creating a history over time of the information and each of the status reports that were submitted each reporting period. And we can even turn on snapshotting so that we can do trending based upon the data that's in here and see how we trend over time against all that information. Now, people can come look at those status reports right in the solution if they're users, but we can also, for external or other audiences, export these status reports to PDF, Word, or email in the body of an email. The key is, is that everything can be done right in here and coalesce all this thing into one place, one plan. Now, if I go back out to the portfolio, and let's say we have this one that's uh, uh, connected to JIRA. And I can drill, by the way, directly without drilling in. I can go right into the work plan or any element of that directly and come into here. And as I look at the work plan and the backlog around here, I see that all I have is two user stories that came in from JIRA at this point. And I can also see that this particular item is connected to JIRA. So if I go to open this item in JIRA, once again, you'll see I'm connected just like I was in Azure DevOps uh, to this. And the idea there is, is that the elements that are in here, and as I add to the backlog here, and as I update things and data in here, the same synchronization via, synchronization via one connect is gonna happen that happened with Azure DevOps. And the key there is, is that I can work with in here if I'm a Jira user, that this is where I live for the execution. I never have to leave here to do that stuff, and the information will be transmitted and updated into one plan. To be quite honest, you can actually update and access one plan features from within here as well. Now, if I go back to the portfolio and I look at just the features in here, and let me just go to you know things like we talked about associating, and I'll get into how we got here in the first place, but we talked about objectives and key results, and we talked about some of the enterprise architecture stuff that we might have. Notice that these features have associated key results that are in the strategic plan. They also have associated products, okay, that are from the more enterprise architecture elements within the solution. And so uh, as we do this, and I'll get into where those things reside in one plan, but let's just say I go down to uh, uh, loyalty points. And I, in this feature, I want to show what I showed before, the visualization of how these things are all interrelated. When I open this up, I can see that loyalty points has to happen before this weighted scoring has to happen uh, in, in there from a, from a feature perspective. But from an overall runway perspective, notice I've got loyalty points as the feature that I'm focused on. But upstream from that, we can see that I actually have two objectives or strategies that this thing is associated or is depending on us for. And there's ten, two tangible key results, one from each objective that is tied to or related to this particular loyalty point. And notice that these things are in the yellow, which means that it's you know getting a little bit off track as well as this feature itself. Now from an enterprise architecture perspective, notice that we're also related and have associated applications that have to be considered in order to succeed with this feature, as well as products they're related to as well. So when we talked about that whole enterprise architecture interrelation, you don't have to tackle all those enterprise architecture elements of it right away as you go into this, but know that the vision is there that if you want to aspire to get to this place, one plan is a tool that can help you get there uh, incrementally over time and get the value from the solution incrementally as you're ready to take it on.
All right. So let's see where some of this stuff came from. You know, the enterprise architecture piece that has the elements here that we're related to in here, you know, came from, um, you know, the different plan types that we have in this enterprise architecture. So in this enterprise architecture, we have a product portfolio, we have a capabilities or business capabilities portfolio, we have an application portfolio, and we have a portfolio of value streams that we can associate our uh, enterprise, I mean, our, our initiatives with uh, in the solution. Uh, another approach to, to having value stream association. Now, if I uh, look in here into the enterprise architecture and I show those plan types, um, let me go into um, expand this. And notice that here in this composite view, I've got a, a mixture of applications, capabilities, products, value streams, et cetera. And notice if I drill into any one of these, I can capture the key elements in this application portfolio about life cycle of the application and application details around vision and strengths and timeline and life cycle and what things it's actually related to. It's related to other items in here, like other capabilities or ideas, or it's even aligned to certain epics within the solution. All those associations can be managed right from within here. Now, uh, as I go, you know, look at this, and I want to visualize other relations from here from just this perspective, let's just say from a value stream perspective, and I want to uh, visualize the relations of, say, this value stream overall, I can see that I actually have a predecessor that this, that this has to happen before I can do procure to pay. But once again, that runway view, and here's something that gets very complex. This quote to cash value stream is supporting a number of key results in three different strategies, one of which, uh, one strategy has gone yellow and one of these key results has actually gone red. Uh, notice downstream that this value stream is associated with different products and applications and business capabilities as we go through here. And at any given point in time, as I want to look at something within this, um, I can drill through to any particular item from here. So for example, this quote to cash, I can actually even just open a quick edit. If I want to look at the details around this, I can come in here and see any of the information around that particular uh, uh, value stream. And I can also very quickly look at details and narratives around that, as well as the associations, like here's associated uh, uh, items that we're associated with, which in this case uh, is a combination of uh, different um, enterprise architecture elements, as well as any associated initiatives, which right now I, I'm not associated with any initiatives but most cases things probably would be. So just give you a highlight of some of that capability there. Another aspect of this, as we look at it to a more of a team focus within more agile approaches, we can define uh, teams uh, within here. In this case, I've defined different teams like the blueprint, the byte, the network, the power team, the A team, et cetera. And as I look through those teams, uh, we can define those teams and what they are but we can also associate them with specific individual resources. So if I come in here and I look at, say, the blueprint team, I can see that this blueprint team is associated with a number of different initiatives, in this case, a whole slew of features that this team is working on right now. And I can get the details around those and drill into any one of those at any given point in time. But I can also then associate at the resource plan level, I can also go into the resource center and as I define these resources in the resource pool, let me take a look at Adam Barr, for example. If I go into his details on here, I can associate him with any one of the teams that we've defined within this solution so that we can uh, uh, have that drill in to individual people and their team association. Now, some organizations may only assign things at the team level. Some things might put things and say, this team's working on it, and then want to define which individuals are working on which pieces of that. That's up to you, but no, just know that that capability of that association is in here. Um, the other element that we have in here uh, that helps us with uh, program increment planning is a PI set of PI planning elements. In this case, we've outlined all of the different program increments and the timeframes and the sprints that are in each of those program in increments. And we can associate these at any given point in time. Uh, with, with anything that you, that you would like to, 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 to work with. And we'll show you how that's used. But the idea is all these elements come together all in one place. Now, overall, we have a resource planning function that allows us to look at, and I showed you earlier, a resource plan just for one in particular feature. 
But as we roll all this stuff together and look at it in the aggregate, here I'm looking at a resource uh, plan group by team. And let's say, for example, I go into that byte team and I look and see who might be on it. I still have generic developer stuff still assigned, but let's take a team member on here. I can look and see that uh, Jin Yang is on a number of different uh, elements within our plan and look at the elements that are in there. Now, once again, I could look at this in terms of hours or FTEs, or we can convert story points into any one of these. But for example, here, I can see with the planning I have in here that I've got Jin Yang uh, over allocated in these three months, uh, right on the money here in June and slightly over allocated here. And we might want to consider what we need to do to get him off of certain things within here. The key there is, is that the resource planning can be done at a more global level. And we can look at things by teams. We can maybe look at things by role or whatever visibility you'd like to have on these types of things as we do resource planning. Once again, an element across the board that we bring to the mix uh, over and above what the uh, uh, Agile execution tools will bring me. Now we talked about intake uh, and demand. There is also an ideation area within one plan that allows us to uh, um, capture requests either directly in here, and we have a, a mode that allows it to be a portal for all users in your organization so that people can put requests in here, and then other users in a more uh, fulfilling role, uh, more, you know, uh, let's just say complete users can actually come in here and evaluate and approve these things. And you can, just like with the uh, other elements in here, you can define an approval lifecycle, the data you'd like to capture in here, potentially, you know, um, the business case in here, or maybe you might have uh, the, the elements in here for an epic hypothesis that would have things like your financials and your um, uh, agile uh, scoring for weighted shortest job first or other prioritization method. And even if you understand maybe up front what some uh, associations that you have, that you might be able to get those in there as well. So the key here is, is that when you go through this process and either through workflow or doing it manually in here by approving these things, at the appropriate time, you can take these ideas or requests and you can reorganize or promote them such that you could take this idea or this request and promote it to an epic or a project and carry forth with it all the details that were done in the idea of the request without having to rekey that into a separate system. The idea is that you can flow end to end uh, from cradle to grave from the idea all the way through. Now, the modeler is the ability for us to come in here and do what if scenarios. So if I go into the modeler, the key here is, is that we can have different scenarios for different parts of the organization. It's very flexible in the fact that you can actually add different models and select which elements, whether they be epics or features or projects or some of all of the above, what criteria you'd like to have to come in here to select what would go into this model. So you don't have to do the entire portfolio. In the interest of time, I'm going to go into one that's already done. So this feature prioritization is a model that was done that allowed us to, in this case, it's already evaluated two different scenarios. In this case, the features that are in here uh, are determined to be the ones that we want to get done in this model. And we want to put some constraints on this to understand if we can do these things at all. Now, one model might be, the first scenario might be where we had a $3 million budget, say. And in that $3 million budget, we wanted to understand what we could fit and what we could get done based on that constraint and the priorities in order to make that happen. And the idea here is that, you know, in one scenario, uh, we might have different constraints. And I think what I'll do is I'll go right to um, uh, a scenario here. And let me just go see, try this first scenario again. And in this first scenario, uh, trying to come within a $3 million budget, uh, which we have, uh, it's selected based on priorities, or we selected in priorities, what's in and what's out, what's below the line and what's above the line. Um, and in another scenario, we might do something more constrained like we only have say two and a half million dollars and what that is. But to cut to the chase, we can analyze a comparison between the two. And in those models, you'll notice that in the scenario two, which has a $2.5 million constraint, we can only do 11 of those features as opposed to 15 in the first one. But we also wanted to set some targets about 
you know, feature points, for example, or target benefits. So for example, if we spend only $2.5 million, we can only expect $4 million in benefits. If we spent the $3 million, we might get another, uh, another half a million dollars, we might get another $1.8 million in benefits. So the key there is we can run these comparisons and even compare details. So if I was going to compare the details of scenario one versus scenario two and compare them, for example, I can see which elements or features are in, which ones are out. And in some cases, you might see that uh, they change prioritization score based upon uh, the different scenarios that we have. And we can even look at this from a charting or dashboard perspective to compare these. So if I compared scenario one with scenario two, for example, and compare this from a charting perspective, I can look at this. Now, um, if I'm really trying to make this work from another scenario perspective, and I get rid of the analysis here, um, I could potentially uh, come in here and look at this, say, from a resource constrained perspective and see if I do all the things in here that I'm con contemplating doing, it's going to take this amount of resourcing to do that. Now, I might decide that, you know, I can't do everything. So I have to decide which maybe two things I eliminate from here and see how it changes the resource profile down below based upon this hypothesis and move those from in to out. So now I only have 15 things in there. But I could also come into here and I could look and put in, say, a Gantt chart view in here, and I could decide on some of these um, um, on some of these, I can decide I might want to delay some of these out and say, you know, what does that do to the resource profile? So I can do a combination of things and save a yet another scenario that says, here's something that might be doable based upon the resources that we have. The idea there is, is that we can do this either from a resource constrained perspective or we can do it from a financial constrained perspective and do the same things uh, with the idea of fitting the selections up above within the time phase budgets that we have. Now, in the portfolio, the key here from an agile perspective is we have the ability to do boards at the portfolio level as well. So as we're doing some of that strategic planning and understanding what we can do, here we're leveraging a board where the columns are actually the program increments that I show you that we had modeled. We also have this shown now by budget and dollars within each program increment, so we can tie those off there. But we can also do these things in a variety of other ways. If I was going to look at this, say, from a story points perspective, I could look at this and see what story points are we have and seeing if we're over and under what our targets are for the story points that we'd like to have within there. If I go to zoom out to get a better view of this, I can take a look and see how things are also interrelated here and even get down to the details of maybe what this uh, proposed uh, uh, feature is and go into a quick edit over here like I did prior and get the details around this feature and understand what it's related to and what we need to do in order to work with this thing and how, uh, other criteria as to why we might want to have this in here or not have this in here as a, relate, a result of our PI planning. And we can move into here any backlog items into the mix if we want to. We can even pre-filter these things based on criteria about how they're associated with different programs or it's, et cetera. So the key is that we can work with this in a very agile board fashion. The last piece I'll show you is the strategy piece. And this is where we look at um, the objectives and key results. We've done a number of different webinars on this, but the idea here is, is as we look at this from this perspective, we can take a look at any of these and say, you know, let's just say we were gonna look at a visualization of um, this increased brand awareness objective and wanna see how this is related with other things. We can get that view very easily from the focal point uh, of a strategy as well.